This video is made possible by donations to the United States Lighthouse Society from people like you. So many of you who've attended uh, lots of these over the last uh, three or four years. And uh, I'm going to have to be pausing occasionally to uh, admit people from the waiting room here. So um, anyway, today is going to be a very interesting uh, presentation. We have our special guest, uh, Linda Osborne Sanoa, who has uh, written a really nice new book. I know you all are familiar with the uh, Arcadia publishing books. Uh, Linda's book is Lighthouses of the North Atlantic Coast. It's uh, postcard images of lighthouses throughout the, the Northeast. Um, so let me go ahead and uh, I'm gonna introduce Linda and she's gonna give us a presentation. Linda's gonna uh, talk about her book, obviously about lighthouse collecting lighthouse postcards. Uh, and so forth. And uh, I just want to, before I introduce Linda, I just want to say that I personally have collected lighthouse postcards going back, I'm going to say at least 35 years now. Uh, you know, some people like to collect um, like harbor lights replicas and things like that, lighthouse tchotchkes or whatever you want to call them. Uh, and I actually have a few, I don't know if you can see them on the uh, shelves behind me, I have a few of those, but, and I have actually like, I don't know, 50 or 60 lighthouse baseball caps, I collect those too, but I have uh, lots and lots of lighthouse postcards, and I, one thing I love about them is they don't take up uh, too much space compared to some things you can collect, so, and they're, it's a lot of fun trying to find uh, cars that you don't have, so for me it's been mostly New England, but some other ones too. Uh, so, uh, Linda, um, I'll tell you a little bit more about Linda's book here. It, it, again, it explores through vintage postcards, many of the lighthouses in Maine, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut, New York, New Jersey, Delaware, and Delaware. Uh, countless people, of course, uh, over the years, including, uh, I think pretty much all of you have enjoyed visiting these lighthouses while on vacation. Uh, and many have sent postcards back home to loved ones. And of course, I think people maybe aren't doing quite so much mailing of postcards these days, but uh, I still do it when I'm on vacation. I know in the early 1900s, certainly it was a very popular thing to do, these, uh, send, to send these vintage postcards to your, your people back home. Linda Osborne Sanoa has had a love of lighthouses for many years. She has a background in photography and genealogy and, of course, vintage lighthouse postcard collecting, and she has a lifelong love of history. Uh, she is the author of Washington Township. She lives in Michigan, I should stay, say, so most of her other books deal with uh, towns uh, near uh, where she lives. Uh, Washington Township, Macomb Township, farming in, in northe northern Macomb County. And uh, Lighthouses Lifesaving on the Great Lakes, and all of those have been published by Arcadia Publishing. She's working on the lighthouses of the South Atlantic and Gulf Coast and lighthouses of the Pacific Coast. I've corresponded with Linda in the past. She was nice enough to send me this copy of her new book, and I really appreciate that. And I was very pleasantly surprised when I looked at the acknowledgments and saw that I was acknowledged in there. Thank you for that, Linda. I appreciate that very much. Uh, so with well, I'm, before I uh, <clears throat> excuse me, before I turn it over to, to Linda, I'll just mention first of all, people always ask. This is being recorded. It will be posted on YouTube within uh, the next couple of days. So if you go to the U.S. Lighthouse Society YouTube channel, uh, you'll be able to see it. Or if you want to tell people about it, uh, it'll be on there within a couple of days, and uh, it'll be uh, 
there'll be a link to it posted on Facebook as well, and also be, eventually be posted on the U.S. Lighthouse Society website probably within the, the next several days. So it will be av available for viewing. So after Linda does her presentation, we'll open it up for Q&A. You can use the chat feature in Zoom to ask your questions. You can do it during the meeting if you want, but you'll an answer the questions at the end. Uh, and also at the end, we'll allow you to unmute yourselves. We'll ask you to digitally raise your hand, virtually raise your hand and do that by clicking on reactions and just click raise hand and that'll, and then we'll call on you. So um, you can do it either way, orally or uh, in the chat. So at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Linda. Uh, thank you so much for being with us today, Linda. And whenever you're ready, you can go ahead and share your screen. Okay. Um, I want to thank everybody for coming today. This is really great. I'm very anxious to kind of start the process and let you find out about these books. Um, I'm very much into these Arcadia books. I love the fact that they will bring to people the way the lights used to look, not necessarily the way they look now. So with any luck, um, I'm hoping you'll enjoy this presentation. I'm going to share my screen. Whether it's the Portland Head Lighthouse in Maine or the Fenwick Island Lighthouse in Delaware, then as now, people have loved to visit these lights while on holidays and especially send postcards back home to loved ones, as Jeremy mentioned. Many of these important navigational aids are still in existence and can be visited thanks to the historical societies and associations that maintain them with such love today. This book is part of the um, Arcadia Publishing Postcard History Series, as Jeremy mentioned. So a few words about a few of the postcards you'll see here. Some are considered RPPC for real photo postcards, while these being usually the black and whites are most often the most ones that are wanting to be collected for some. You will see that there's uh, also linen versions because of the textured finish on the cards, and you will find these among the colored cards displayed here. We'll talk a little bit more about those cards at the end of the presentation. Normally, my next statement would be, what is the lighthouse? And from what Jeremy told me, this is a group that knows very well what a lighthouse is. So we're going to pretty much skip over that portion of the program. It sounds as if I've got some very knowledgeable people on board here. So let's move on to the lights themselves as seen through the postcards. This is the Absicon Lighthouse in Atlantic City, New Jersey. It's a brick cone shaped tower, which was built in 1856. The 171 foot tall tower with a spiral staircase has 223 steps that lead to the first order Fresno lens with a fixed white light and a 22 mile visibility. It is considered the tallest lighthouse in the state of New Jersey. Two separate keeper's houses were built within the head keeper's house attached by a 30 foot passageway. The tower's first coat of paint was done in 1871 when it was first painted white with the 52-foot red band in the middle. In 1876, the erosion began to become a problem and jetties were built to shore up the shore. The lights would go through a number of color changes through the years, although the state went with the white with red and a yellow and black color was used as its day mark also. This light was deactivated in 1933. 
This next one is called Block Island North Lighthouse in New Shoreham, Rhode Island. There were at least four lighthouses built over the years on the north end of the six mile long Block Island. In 1837, saw a rectangular granite keeper's dwelling with a light tower at each end of the building roof. These two lights were lined up on a north-south axis where they would look like one light until the ships were within two or three miles of the lighthouse itself. In 1867, the current lighthouse was built in the Victorian and Gothic revival style as a two-story dwelling with Connecticut granite used. The pitch slate roof where the iron lantern room and tower were situated on the north end of the roof line. Block Island Lighthouse was automated in 1956, and by 1973, it had become deactivated. Cape Helipen Lighthouse in Lewes, Delaware. The light was built on a foundation on top of a sand dune. Although at the great distance from the sea, with erosion encroaching on the shoreline, the stability of the light tower was always endangered. In 1914, the lighthouse service found that the costly erosion could not be halted except at great cost. The stone 69-foot tower was built in the 1767 and survived the British in 1777. The light keepers had a two-story wood frame dwelling with a wraparound porch. The lantern room was fitted with a first order Fresnel lens. By 1897, the sand surrounding the tower was thought to be blowing away at a rate of three to five feet each year. The light had to be deactivated in 1924. And in 1926, the Kate Halepin Lighthouse would complete collapse completely into the Atlantic Ocean. This light is the Chatham Lighthouse in Chatham, Massachusetts. In 1808, two octagonal wooden towers, 40 foot tall and 70 feet apart were erected along with a one story, three room keeper's house. By 1841, both towers were torn down and replaced by brick towers constructed 70 feet apart, along with a new keeper's dwelling, 17 by 26 feet in size, connecting the towers to the dwelling with a covered walkway. Due to erosion, a new light station was built across the road in 1877 along with the keeper's dwelling that also included room for the assistant. The South Tower would receive a fourth order Fresnel lens and the North Tower was removed and soon became known as the Nauset light. The Chatham light was automated in 1982. Here is the Brandywine Shoal Lighthouse in Delaware Bear Bay, New Jersey. This is an example of a linen postcard. On the north side of the shipping channel, just west of Cape May in 1858, a network of interconnecting iron piles circled the lighthouse where the dwelling was made of cast iron plates bolted together and lined with wood. A third order Fresno lens was fitted into the lantern room. Two floors were used as living quarters for the keepers, but by 1914, it was deemed unnecessary and torn down. This is Fire Island Lighthouse at the Robert Moses State Park in New York. By 1857, the 1926 first light was found to be inadequate because of its height restrictions and lack of visibility. A large keeper's dwelling and replacement light were built in 1858 with a 168-foot tower. 
It used the stone from the original tower for the base and granite from New York for the dwelling. Homemade bricks used for the new tower were covered in a protective cement coating in a cream color. The new tower was fitted with a first order Fresno lens in 1891. The lighthouse was given its present distinctive alternating black and white stripes. In 1912, due to a crack in the tower structure, in order to strengthen the light, it was wrapped in iron bands and steel mesh coated with a layer of cement. This light was decommissioned in 1973. The Hereford Inlet Lighthouse, North Wildwood, New Jersey. The south side of the Hereford Inlet leads from the Atlantic Ocean to the Intracoastal Waterway from Maine to Florida. In 1874, the Hereford Inlet in the village of Anglesey is where a wood framed Carpenter Gothic style lighthouse with a 50 foot tower connected to the dwelling was built. A fourth order Fresno lens was fitted in the lantern room with a visibility of 13 miles. In 1913, damage to the foundation created the need to move the lighthouse 150 feet westward after a severe storm. The lighthouse was deactivated during World War II during concerns of German submarines present in the Atlantic coast. Although the lighthouse was vacant for almost 20 years, when re restoration began, the paint color was returned to its original buffed color. This is another example of a linen postcard. And here's Jeremy's home port, I believe. This is Portsmouth Harbor Lighthouse, or Fort Point, Newcastle, New Hampshire. In 1771, the royal governor, John Wentworth, had a hexagonal wooden lighthouse built at Fort Point in Portsmouth Harbor. It was one of 11 lighthouses in the 13 colonies to be established before the American Revolution. Although Britain's King George III forbid the Americans from access to arms and powder, they would soon find a way to acquire what they needed. The Fort of William and Mary, so named by the British, was rebuilt after the War of Independence and called Fort Constitution in 1800. A new light was built in 1804, a short distance from the original and a bridge built of wood was used to access the light. The light tower was 80 feet tall with the keeper residing in the village and not at the light itself. By 1851, the tower was shortened to 55 feet and a fourth order Fresno lens was added. The lighthouse was replaced in 1877 with a cast iron tower lined with brick. A brown color was used as its day mark. In 1902, the color was changed to white. The light has become automated in 1960, and it came under the care of the Friends of the Portsmouth Harbor Lighthouse in 2001. Linda, can I just interject something about that one? Would you mind going? Could you possibly go back to that one for a second? If you hit your back arrow, you should, there yeah. you go. Yeah, I just, you were talking before about how these cards are so great because they show you what the place used to look like. So they, if you get, you know, postcards over a, a period of history, you see, uh, you get uh, snapshots of what the place looked like at different times. So this, I'm guessing that this card is, what would you say, 19... 20s or 30s or something like that could be without kind of looking at the backs of them i couldn't tell yeah. right on hand but yeah yeah i don't think it's it's not i know it's not real early 1900s for one thing you said the lighthouse was brown until 1902 and the keeper's house on the left there wasn't moved to where it is now like where it is in this picture until 1906 another interesting thing about this 
postcard is that you see the fog bell on the side of the lighthouse that was in place there from 1896 to about 1970 now it's on display on the coast guard station this is all on a coast guard station so it's it's neat seeing the fog bell there and the uh the walkway out to the lighthouse has been reconfigured a couple of times so when this picture was taken it went kind of along the shore and actually went i think as much as like 300 feet because uh it was still it still went out to where the keeper's house had been just before they moved it but then later it was uh it was repositioned so anyway so there's a number of interesting things that this would I be off by saying that I believe I've got a card that also has this as part of a um, a fort when it was a fort? Yeah, absolutely. Um, actually, between the keeper's house and the little oil house that's behind the walkway there in this right near the center of this picture, just to the left of the oil house, you see part of the fort wall there, actually. That's uh, Fort Constitution. And there's an outer granite wall that that's part of from the 1860s. And there's an inner part of the fort that goes back to the early 1800s. So, so yeah, the fort. Very, uh, I was very fortunate to find a card that also had it not quite as clear as maybe this one showed it, but you can see the fort in it. And mm -hmm. I just thought that was interesting because of it, how far back it went. Yeah, the fort's also gone through lots of changes over the years, so the postcards will capture that as well. Just one more thing I'll mention before I shut up here, but uh, in this postcard, and you see it on a lot of the old postcards, that obviously these pictures were taken during the day, and during the day, back in the days when the, the Fresnel lenses were active in the lighthouses, they would either draw curtains or pull shades in the lantern rooms during the day, and in this picture, you can see the shades are pulled in the lantern room of the lighthouse, and that was to protect the lens. And also the, in the days of kerosene uh, lamps, they were afraid that the sunlight shining, shining on the lens could actually ignite the kerosene inside the lens. So in these daytime pictures, you always see the uh, curtains or shades drawn. So I thought I'd mention that too. And I'll be quiet now and you can go ahead, Linda. Okay. This light is a um, good example of our PPC cards, real photo postcards that these are. This is Burnt Coat Harbor or Hockamuck Head, Swans Island, Maine. At the entrance to Burnt Coat Harbor, a light station was built on the southernmost point called Hockamuck Head on Swans Island in 1872. Originally built with twin towers to be used as range lights, the second light was removed in 1884. A story and a half white clappered keeper's house was connected to the 32 foot tower, was erected with a lantern room to house the fourth order Fresno lens. In 1975, the original Fresno lens was removed and replaced with an automatic light nearby. Soon found to be not quite as bright, but in 1978, the tower was relit with a 250 millimeter optic lens, now maintained by the tower town of Swans Island. It is now listed in the National Register of Historic Places. This lovely light is Point Comfort Lighthouse in Keensburg, New Jersey. Keensburg had two lighthouses that worked in conjunction with one another. In a range line, the lower one, the Point Comfort Beacon on the Raritan Bay, and the higher one, <laughs> Wackacack Light on Creek Road. The Point Comfort Beacon was built in 1856, a wooden one and a half story school type structure that served as the keeper's dwelling with the square wooden tower attached to the middle of the roof line. By 1867, repairs to the kitchen and roof of reshingling were needed along with a coat of paint. In 1883, jetties were built because of the erosion of the bank. Riprap was added for the protection of the lighthouse foundation. In 1904, was to see 400 tons of riprap 
deposited again to help the jetties hold back the erosion. The lighthouse was destroyed by fire in the 1950s. This light at Bass Harbor Lighthouse in Bass Harbor, Maine. The Mount Desert Island is the largest island along the Maine coast and the Bass Headlight sits at its southernmost point. In 1858, a light was needed to guide mariners safely into Bass Harbor. The light sits on a granite bluff 56 feet above sea level, making the 32 foot tower have a visibility of 13 miles. The keeper's home was a 20 by 40 foot wooden building that connected to the tower by a wooden walkway. The two story dwelling had five rooms on the first floor and two rooms on the second. Over the years, modifications were made to update the tower and its keeper's dwelling. The lighthouse was automated in 1974 and now is in the care of the United States Coast Guard. Nobska Point Lighthouse is in Falmouth, Massachusetts. The original light built in 1828 was a one and a half story Cape Cod style dwelling with an octagonal tower on top of the keeper's house. Stress due to the weight of the lantern room made changing the tower a necessity. In 1876, a 40-foot cast iron brick line tower was built along with a wood frame dwelling. A covered walkway was also added in 1899. The fifth order lens was used until 1887 when a fourth order lens was used to replace it. The light was automated in 1985 and became home to the Coast Guard Auxiliary. This is Owl's Head Lighthouse in Owl's Head, Maine. In 1825, on 17 acres on the south side of Rockland Harbor, a lighthouse was built after approval from the sixth president, John Quincy Adams. By 1852, the original stone tower was in need of replacement. A 24 foot tall round tower was built along with new one and a half story keeper's house framed in wood was added to the property. The tower had a fourth order Fresnel lens when completed in 1856. 1903, a covered walkway linking the house to the tower was completed. In 1932, after the tower was electrified, the need for the covered walkway seemed unnecessary and with the expense of the upkeep, upkeep it was removed permanently. Owl's Head Light became automated in 1989 and by 2007, Owl's Head became under the care of the American Lighthouse Foundation. This light is Primaquid Point in Bristol, Maine. In 1631, immigrants from Bristol, England started a settlement at Primaquid Point, but it was actually 1826 before a rubble stone tower and a 20 by 34 foot keeper's house would make the point important to navigation. Barely eight years later, another tower would be needed to replace the original. This tower is 30 feet up the lantern and with a 16 foot diameter base. By 1857, the tower received a fourth order Fresnel lens and the need for a new keeper's house was acted upon. The light station was known for its ease as approaching from land, but access from the sea was difficult. By 1934, Primaquid Point was converted to an automatic acetylene gas operation. 1940 saw the residents of Bristol, Maine purchase the property with the Coast Guard still maintaining the tower care. 
This light is on Pond Island in Phelpsburg, Maine. The tower and dwellings that were built in 1821, 1835, and 1843 had all seen need of improvements. So in 1855, a 20-foot tower erected of a stronger brick would be fitted with a fifth order Fresnel lens along with a wood frame keeper's dwelling connecting to the tower by a covered walkway. A new lantern was built in 1896 and the keeper's dwelling was given a much needed renovation. In August of 1960, the Coast Guard automated the light station. At that time, all the outer buildings were destroyed by the Coast Guard. In 1973, it became under the management of the Maine Coastal Islands National Wildlife Refuge. Portland Head Light, Cape Maine Elizabeth. Completed in 1791, the original plans called for the tower at Portland Head Light at Portland Point to be 58 feet tall, but during construction it was raised to 72 feet. By 1813, it was lowered by 20 feet. By 1864, it was raised again by 20 feet. By 1883, the tower would once again be lowered by 20 feet. By 1884, with complaints, the shorter tower was once again raised by 20 feet and a second order lens fitted in the lantern room. By 1816, they had a new one-story keeper's house, 20 by 34 feet, built of stone with room for two rooms, attic and an area for a kitchen. And because of the inclement weather, there was need for the keeper's area to be attached to the tower. By 1891, the stone keeper's house was taken down and a wood frame duplex 42 feet by 42 feet was built with room for both the head keeper and his assistant keeper. Over the years, many changes and improvements would be made to the tower and the dwelling as weather pushed the limits of the structures. On August 7th, 1989, the light became automated and commemorated on the 20th anniversary of the lighthouse service. Situate Lighthouse in Boston, Massachusetts. By 1810, the South Shore of Boston a small group of men constructed a 25 foot tall octagon granite tower along with a one and a half story dwelling. In 1827, an additional 15 feet were added to the height of the tower along with a new lantern to help with the visibility. Being so close to Minot's ledge light, its powerful light, by 1860, the situate light was discontinued. The Fresno lens and lantern room were removed and the property put up for lease. In 1916, the residents of Situate bought the light from the government and the refurbishing would start. The tower was relit in 1994 for use in private navigation after being dark for 134 years. Another example of the linen cards, this is the Seagirt Lighthouse in Seagirt, New Jersey. Along a section of the New Jersey coast is an area called Seagirt, which is not far from where the Manas, excuse it for anybody from New Jersey, I'm not very good with this name. The Manas River flows into the Atlantic Ocean. The 38 miles that lay between Barnegat and the Navasink lighthouses made the beach at Seagirt, just south of Wreck Pond, the selected location and the property was purchased in 1895. By 1896, a keeper's house was built as an L-shaped red brick Victorian structure 
with an attached tower that rose above the roof line of the dwelling. A fourth order Fresno lens was fit in the lantern room. The revolving lens had a flashing red light. Seagirt would go on to be the last lighthouse used built in the Atlantic coast, having a tower and the dwelling connected as one structure. The light was deactivated just before World War II and the lens removed. The structure was used during the war by the Coast Guard as a station to watch the water for U-boat movement. The following years had the lighthouse used as a Seagirt library and venue for meetings. Restoration of the light began in 1981. The Hudson Athens Lighthouse in Hudson, New York is located between Hudson's and Athens on a sandy ridge called Middle Ground Flats. A lighthouse was construction, constructed in 1874. A second empire style brick dwelling with the mansard roof was situated on a granite foundation and a sixth order Fresno lens on the light tower is centered on the Western face of the red brick eight room dwelling. This light was automated in 1949. The Statue of Liberty Lighthouse on Bedloe Island in New York was used as a marine navigational aid for ships entering New York Harbor. Bedloe Island is a 12 acre island. The statue was made of an iron skeleton covered with a copper, copper skin sitting on a granite foundation. In order for the lights to be seen, two rows of circular windows were added to the copper covered flame. The designer of the light, Frederick Bartholdi, had not thought how to light the statue when it was dedicated in 1886. The torch on the statue rose 300 feet, 305 feet above sea level and nine electric arc lamps were used for the lighting that could be seen 24 miles out to sea. In 1902, the statue would no longer be an active aid for navigation and now is in the hands of the National Park Service as one of our great national attractions. This is the Southeast Block Island Lighthouse, also in North Shoreham in Rhode Island. Another example of linen postcards. The Block Island is south of Rhode Island's coast and lies in the middle of the east-west, north-south shipping lanes. In 1872, Congress appropriated $75,000 to bring a lighthouse to the south coast of the island. It was always going to be a special light, so a brick dwelling with an attached 67-foot tower with the first order lens was designed as a high Victorian Gothic with Italianate influence. The red brick 52-foot tower was constructed in 1874 on the Mahanagan Bluffs in the south end of Block Island. A cast iron lantern was 15 feet tall and held the fixed order Fresno lens. The keeper's dwelling was built attached to the tower where the keeper had one side and the assistant keeper had rooms on the other. When the light was built, there was 300 feet to the cliff edge. By the early 1900s, it was but 55 feet. It was then relocated a safe distance by the International Chimney Company. This company went on to relocate a number of other lighthouses that were also in peril. After the move, the light received the first order Fresno lens that had been used in the Cape Lookout Lighthouse in North Carolina and still aids in navigation today. This is Fenwick Island Lighthouse on the Delaware, Maryland state line. 
The lighthouse was built on an isolated peninsula in Delaware at the Maryland state line. A new lighthouse situated between Cape Helipin in the southern entry to Delaware Bay and the Astantic Asantecued Island would lessen the 60 mile gap between the two. By 1858, a brick double walled 87 foot tower was constructed with a lantern room fitted with a third order Fresnel lens. A two story wooden frame keeper's dwelling was built at the same time just east of the light for both the head keeper and his assistant. The light was automated in 1978 and soon deactivated, with ownership going to the state of Delaware with restoration and with the help of a support group, it was rededicated in 1998. The Rockland Breakwater Light of Rockport, Maine. In June 1900, Congress appropriated $30,000 for a lighthouse at the outer end of the Rockland Breakwater. The station had a one and a half story gambled roofed wood frame keeper's dwelling with an attached brick fog signal building. The lantern held a fourth order Fresnel lens with a focal plane of 30 feet. The keepers' families did not live at the station till 1915. The light would go on to be automated in 1965. Here's just a point where a couple notes on these postcards. The Postal Act of May 19, 1898, provided for the extensive private production of postcards to measure 3.25 by 5.5 inches. Messages could only be written on the front of the card. The back was reserved exclusively for the address. After March 1st of 1907, the law specified that messages could be written on the backs of cards. Cards of this new style were called divided back because of the vertical line to the left of which a message could be written and the address on the right. Undivided back cards remained in the inventories of shops for many years. Now they're considered very collectible. You will have seen many of those type of cards here. I want to thank you all. I'm hoping it was, I was able to answer a few questions and that you might have had about some of these beautiful lights. Okay, Linda, thank you so much. Uh, and as you're speaking, I, I happen to be uh, scanning uh, postcards lately for the USLHS archives. I have, a, I have a couple of stacks of postcards right in front of me and I'm looking at one right on top here. That's an undivided back. It's uh, not a very good picture, but it's Anasquam Lighthouse in Gloucester, Massachusetts. And uh, it's kind of neat that it has that kind of classic undivided back on it. And so uh, it's uh, it's fascinating the different styles of postcards over the years. And well, uh, I, I love the one in the example because here was this lovely picture of the fight of the lighthouse. And because they couldn't write on the back, yep. they just wrote all over the picture. In yeah, the I have some of those too, where they wrote all over the, the picture because that's what they had to do if they wanted to. Well, right? sometimes they left a band on, you know, like the right side, there'd be a white band or right. maybe on the bottom. Yeah. But not always too often, quite often, yes. They yeah, just they wrote, didn't write much of a message there, but they wrote a couple of words in the margin there. So they did leave room for it in that case, yeah. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. um, by the way, it's I believe it's pronounced Manasquan River in New Jersey, oh, and I had to go. I cheated. I had to Google that, but I believe it's the okay. Manasquan River. But, oh, there's a few names in there that were giving me some difficulty. Not well. Around they the would. Yeah, I um, 
I don't, I'm not to correct you or anything, but I just did a podcast episode a couple of weeks ago on uh, Absecon Lighthouse in, uh, in Atlantic Absecon. City, New Jersey. Absecon. People, you said Absecon, pe people say that all the time, but they'll, they'll tell you, if you go there, they'll tell you it's Absecon. And they have every right to do that too. <laughs> yeah. we well, you, know, you, you never know these places, you know, there's, there's uh, unique pronunciations all over the country. You don't know unless you... Uh... Well, here in Michigan, we have a very big holiday area called Mackinac. Right. And, some, and, and it's usually called... spelled with a C at the end. Well, there's why that has happened. The city itself is pronounced, used with a W. The island, the bridge, people talking, it's got a C at the end. But and it's yet, still pronounced yeah, Mackinac. Still always <laughs> pronounced Mackinac, but that we seems... had Mackinac and yeah. that type of thing. So yeah. I don't take offense to it. I don't think <laughs> most people do. Yeah, well, you have to live live there or be told to, otherwise you just don't know. Yeah. So uh, we'd certainly uh, be happy to take any questions people might have, maybe questions about collecting postcards or different types of postcards or whatever whatever you want to ask um let me see i don't see any questions in the chat uh if anybody wants to verbally ask any questions uh you can click on um uh reactions and click raise hand and we'll see that you have your hand raised and we can call on you um somebody uh, uh <laughs> Speaking of pronunciations, uh, Shadara, maybe, uh, Wood, Shadara Wood is asking, uh, I would love to know how Linda got into collecting and the best place to find cards. Those are two good questions. Well, I guess it sort of started where I used to like to go up to the lights. Michigan, needless to say, is surrounded by them. So if you live in this state, you don't have to drive too many miles before you're going to run into some lighthouse in one direction or another. I used to like to go and photograph them myself. And there were times where um, there would be some level of disappointment that I guess the lights in old pictures I'd seen, the lights weren't quite looking the same. I took me a while to learn that a lot of times once the Coast Guard had taken over the care of the lights way back, um, they found that it was too costly to maintain these light stations. So many times they would take down a lot of the buildings around the lights. And I found that by finding these cards, I was finding an example of what the lights look like before this had happened. And along with these other books and why I've kind of dealt with um, Arcadia is I like, I feel like the old, um, the old ways need to be documented. They need to be uh, put down. We have to have progress. Things happen for a reason. But I just always felt that I wanted people to see how these lights were when they were at their uh, most important. And as far as the other part of your question, I find a lot of them on eBay. I go to postcard conventions. I go through the portion. Um, I started collecting them not as long back as Jeremy did. I've probably got about five, six years into this. Um, it does become a com compassionate type of, uh, you can go overboard with it. It com comes an addiction, I would say. <laughs> That's a good way of putting it because every time when doing the books with my other book on the Great Lakes, I would see a card and I had try to do it to where I could put a, a card where the buildings were close up and then maybe one where it kind of showed more of a, an overview of the entire area. But no matter each time I'd say you're going to limit it to two cards on these lights, that never happened. 
every time I might see one and think, well, this one just might be a little bit better. My last book, I held up the production a little bit by saying, really, I need to change out some cards because I found some even nicer photos for them. So that's, yeah, it can become an addiction. But I also find you have to really, really pay attention. Sometimes I find I would get a little too excited seeing a card that I really could use, um, only to find that it might have been a reproduction, a copy. And those are not the type of cards I particularly want in what I would call my collection. Um, so I suggest if you're ever looking for some, really read them. Try not to let your excitement, because I've been burned a few times by that. And I'm not one to want to say to somebody, hey, I, I feel I need to return this. I don't like doing that. And if it's my own mistake for not paying attention close enough, then you kind of start learning from your mistakes. Yeah. Um, I just want to mention, uh, speaking of where to, where to find the, the cards. Um, yeah, I, of course I find a lot on eBay now in the early days of when I started collecting, it was, uh, flea markets. There used to be more flea markets, at least in new England, they be on the weekends, you know, some of them huge flea, there's still some, but, um, I find a lot of postcards there and antique stores. A lot of those antique stores have closed over the years. So yeah. eBay is certainly one of the, the biggest sources now, but if anybody's in Maine or New England, I will recommend one particular store, and I can't quite think of the name of it, but it's the only one of its type in the area on uh, Route 1 in Arundel, Maine, which is not that far up the coast in southern Maine, and it's like a co-op antique store, and there's a couple of dealers that have fantastic postcard offerings. And I can't leave that place without buying at least a couple of lighthouse postcards. So that's one of the, the few stores around where you can still find some good stuff. So if you're, if you're in Maine, go to that uh, antique store on Route 1 in Arundel. <laughs> I think some of the ones in, in the, that area, in Wells, too, to the south of that, there's some uh, that have some as well. Hey, but, you um, know, what I was going to say, after a while, when you start collecting enough of them, you'll be somewhere, whether it's at a postcard co uh, convention, where I never realized uh, how, how uh, important and how busy these type of things are, because postcards were done where people can collect them on so many different subjects. Uh, surely lighthouses is not the only one. Um, but now I'll look at them and I'll think, boy, that looks familiar. Do I have that card already? <laughs> that happens to That's me all the time. That's when it to get difficult is to know, do I have it or did I see it and want to get it? Yeah. Or, or what? Been so, there, been there, done that. Yeah. <laughs> That's yes. why I have duplicates of quite a few of them. But, oh, yeah. Um, so there's a couple of questions actually Three questions, just, just new questions have popped up in the chat. Um, one of them, I'm not sure we can answer too, too well here. At least I, I don't think I can. But uh, Betty says, my daughters are taking me on a lighthouse adventure between Erie, Pennsylvania and Toledo. We have only two days. Which are the best ones to see? Now, I know there's three lighthouses right around Erie, Pennsylvania. But I'd have to look on the map and figure out what others... Uh, Ashtabula, maybe, um, but um, Linda, I don't know if you have any comment on that. Oh, you know that area very well. I would have to pick up my Great Lakes Lighthouse book and look through that for all the ones I've come in contact with so many. It's, you know what, you could seriously even Google something like that. Oh, yeah. There's maps out there that will tell you um, where each of the lights are. Yeah. And but you're best off looking into it to make sure that the light is there. Yeah. There are some that are no longer around, even though they're quite popular. 
Um, yeah, some will show up on Google Maps that don't exist anymore. That does that does happen. But yeah. I would recommend the Lighthouse Friends website. I'm sure most of you know uh, Craig Anderson is great website lighthousefriends.com that has every lighthouse in the country with directions and tour information and so forth so check that out uh for the areas you're going to and i'm sure you'll find some useful information there for sure um yeah somebody uh shadara says uh presque isle lighthouse is beautiful and you can go up in it with great volunteers yeah i just featured the presque isle lighthouses on my podcast recently um David asks, could Linda explain how Arcadia decides to publish specific books? And I'll just mention before you answer that, Linda, I've done, I did this book for Arcadia a few years ago, Wave Swept Lighthouses of New England. And I'm currently working on one on Lighthouses of New Hampshire. I'm in the middle of working on it. And my deadline is coming up. So I'm working, <laughs> working hard on the weekends on that. Um, so, uh, I know you can propose books to Arcadia and occasionally they'll seek out people to do certain subjects. That's kind of happened to me too. But Linda, what's your experience with that? Well, when I did my first book, um, these were more local, localized books. I had kind of fallen into this very um, uh, comically in as much as I had been doing some genealogical research at my local library where we have an area next to where I live in Washington called Romeo. And it has some huge uh, old Victorian mansions and they wanted, they wanted work that if somebody came in and said, well, I've just bought this on Main Street, who might have lived here before? So I was kind of doing this work for them and getting very, very interested in it. And I came across some of the Arcadia books, which I had been purchasing. I kind of will buy them as a um, reminder of someplace that I may have visited, although I may not have known the old, what they look like in the old times. I've just always been fascinated by these, the vintage photographs of places. And I ended up asking the librarian, I said, why haven't they done an Arcadia book on Washington? And as it turns out, she says, well, you haven't written it. And I was a little baffled by that because I didn't understand it. I had assumed the books I was buying from Arcadia were written by Arcadia. Well, that's where I learned that they aren't. They're written by people who have an interest in history, um, are willing to do the work. You do not write them to get rich, not by any stretch of the imagination, not Arcadia books. I concur, <laughs> but, yes. but it's worth it. But it's well worth doing it. And after doing my first one, I couldn't wait to get on to the second. And now it turns out I've, put out five in five years. Last year, I kind of uh, changed tax and decided to use my lighthouse postcards to do one on the Great Lakes because I've loved the Great Lakes lighthouses. Again, I've gone there to photograph them. So what I did was I contacted the um, acquisitions editor at who I had been dealing with for the previous few books. And I just proposed the fact that uh, they have a postcard series, uh, history series. It's a little different than their normal history series, but basically you're doing the same thing. You're just not using vintage photographs. You're using postcards and basically vintage ones. They're not going to use anything color any of my color linen cards are in the book as black and white. They only deal in black and white. But I put this proposal to them and thought, if you don't have one on the Great Lakes, I would very much like to um, do one with the postcards. So you send that in to them. They put it before a, a board, I'm, I'm assuming is the way it sounds. And then they come back and say, congratulations. Now you've got six months to get this done. 
<laughs> yeah. So well, you can kind of negotiate that a bit. I I kind of yes, did that. I'm my, sure. Yeah. I'm sure, but I just um, I mentioned what I wanted to do, and now I'm working on two others at the same time, and this will probably be my end result when I get those done. Um, but it's just been such a rewarding experience. I love it. And what I love the most is I want people to be able to see what these lighthouses look like when they were in their heyday. That's yeah. really the best, you know, thing I can say. Mm -hmm. I, I agree completely. It's a valuable historic record of these, these places. Um, uh, Joseph says, thank you, Linda. Can we look forward to other presentations, say the Great Lakes? Certainly we can uh, we can maybe do, the, do that sure. down the road. I would love to do that. Those are my, um, I guess you'd say my home, yep. home lights. Um, and it's been fun. Although I will say this, as I had mentioned to Jeremy, when I was doing that book, I felt I had to cheat a little bit to put vintage photographs of some of the lights, because again, in this process, you can look up lights, and I'm using eBay as a particular, uh, say, situation, and you'll find tons of photographs or tons of postcards on certain lights, and then you will find absolutely nothing that's vintage on some lights. Mm -hmm. And I ran into the dilemma of how do I, some of our big lights here in the Great Lakes, how do I not include them just because I don't have a postcard? So Arcadia was more than willing to allow me to use some photographs. And I was very lucky that as I went to get to the point of turning the book into them, I was able to kind of switch out a few that I did manage to find cards for, but that has been a problem. And I'm finding that, you know, even with the books I'm working on now, you can have a list of all these lights. That doesn't mean there's a card available. And I don't particularly want to use modern. I don't think they want me to use modern cards. So, run, into, run into copyright issues with those two, of course. Yes. Yeah. So I know exactly what you're talking about. I've run into the same thing with the New England region. There's some like Portland Head or Pembroke Point or whatever you might find lots, but others there's nothing. Yes. Uh, some of the more remote ones, especially, tend to there not aren't so many. Stratford Shoal would be one that springs to mind for me in the New England region that's out Long Island Sound between New York and uh, Connecticut. And uh, I don't think I've ever yeah. seen a postcard of it. But anyway. It makes you um, wonder why, quite frankly. I mean, if they were taking so many, but it it's it's frustrating because you think I I it's something you can't get your hands on. In your yeah, room. well, if you like, like I think we're the same, Linda, and that you you do get kind of obsessed with it. You want to get yeah. every one, at least for your region. Uh, you know, you want to get every lighthouse represented, but it's just just not possible in some cases. For me, it was harder when doing the Great Lakes book and struggling to find some of the cards I needed. Mm. And since the book has been produced and obviously you can't change it now suddenly there's the cards you're looking for of they course <laughs> yeah well that goes without saying that kind of thing always happens so yeah. you know that's that's called murphy's law i believe yeah so i've got i'm looking at your book again right here and you know there's so many cards that i there's a lot that i have that i'm familiar with but there's a lot i think more that i'm not familiar with you know you found some really great ones and uh did a great job putting the book together so i definitely well i look it. at so, that as, as with all the cards that i've purchased that this is probably um my family's inheritance are in these postcards yeah um and i guess that's a way for it to be doled out a little at a time in a sense because 
somebody would either have to sell them all or whatever as time comes. But um, no, it's become a very, very rewarding. Um, it just put my love of photography and my love of history almost together. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was just a natural, yeah. natural thing to fall into. Mm -hmm. Well, you're doing a great service by putting these books out. So thank you for doing that. Thank you for doing this today. Uh, I don't want to cut things short too suddenly. If anybody has any other questions, people are thanking you uh, and hoping for another presentation you from you. Coming. Um, so thank you. Yeah, thank you again, Linda. I just want to mention a couple of things before we sign off for today. One is that we have three more Zoom events actually scheduled in the next couple of months. One is with the people at Montauk Lighthouse. New York and Long Island, August 23rd, and they are in the midst of celebrating uh, restoration of the lighthouse and repainting of the lighthouse and some other exciting things that are happening. Uh, Mia Sertich, the director of Montauk Lighthouse, is going to take part in that. Also, Admiral Dan May, I think he might have been with us for part of this or maybe he's still here now, but uh, Dan is uh, involved with some of the work going on at uh, Montauk as well. Then on September 9th, we're doing one with Fairweather Island Lighthouse in Connecticut, Bridgeport, Connecticut, also known as Black Rock Harbor Lighthouse. Uh, it's the 200th anniversary of that lighthouse, and that had, had a very famous woman keeper, Kate Moore. So we'll be talking about all that September 9th. And then on September 30th, um, we'll have a special guest, Teresa Levitt. And I'm sure a lot of you know her book, A Short Bright Flash classic book about Augustin Fresnel and his uh, lens that was such an important invention used in lighthouses all over the world. It's really a great book and I'm really looking forward to doing that event with Teresa. So that's gonna be on se uh, September 30th. Um, I also wanna mention, uh, check out uslhs.org to see the tours that are coming up. There are some tours for next year that uh, both domestic and foreign tours that have room in them if you're interested in that. And uh, one other thing I want to mention, some of you know about this, but the U.S. Lighthouse Society is currently having a dance contest. If you don't know about that, it's a little hard to explain in just a couple of words quickly here, but basically we are asking people to dance at lighthouses close to National Lighthouse Day. National Lighthouse Day is August 7th, as I'm sure a lot of you know. You don't have to do the dance on the August 7th, but the deadline for submitting videos is August 14th. I'm actually gonna briefly share my screen here because I wanna show you all something. And let's see, you should be seeing my screen at this point with the page on the, the front page of the US Lighthouse Society website. I hope you're seeing it. Linda, are you seeing it? I sure am. Okay, and uh, go to the middle of the page where it says what's new and click on National Lighthouse Day Dance Contest and you'll go to a page that explains all about it. And my good friend Joe Rivers, you see here, has written a, a original song called Meet Me at the Lighthouse. And that's what we're asking people to dance to. It's about four minutes long. You do not have to dance to the whole song. Uh, but also like here in Portsmouth, I'm getting a group of, uh, of kids from an Irish step dancing school that are gonna come and dance in front of the lighthouse. So you don't have to dance yourself. If you know a local dance school or some local kids, it just, we're just trying to get people to have fun. So I'll just play the beginning of the song here. Actually, I don't think I selected share audio, so you're probably not hearing it. So never mind. You can hear it on your own. <laughs> Let me come out of screen sharing. You have to go to the page and listen to it yourselves, but I think it's a great song. It's got a good beat. It's very danceable. So I hope some of you will take part or, uh, or help and or help spread the word about that because it's a lot of fun. I'm getting really good feedback on it. So with that, uh, I think we can uh, probably wrap things up for today. I really appreciate everybody attending today as always. And uh, we have a severe thunderstorm watch. It's really dark out here. So I'm glad we weren't interrupted by that. It hasn't quite arrived yet. But anyway, thank you all so much. And thank you, Linda. This was, this was great. It was a pleasure uh, having thank you. Thank you, Jeremy, for all your help. And thank you all for showing up to listen to this. Um, it's so wonderful to be able to share the information. Thank you so much. Thank you again. Have a great rest of the weekend, everybody. We'll see you next time. Keep a good light.